Okay, hello there everyone and welcome to today's District Administration Web Seminar. It's great to have you all with us. My name is Kurt Isadurley. I'm the Web Seminar Editor here at DA and I'll be your moderator. The title of our event, as you see here, is How to Support Positive Math Classrooms and is being brought to you through the generous support of our sponsor for today, McGraw-Hill. First off, as uh, members of our audience are still coming in here, a bit of background about our topic and what we'll be learning about here today. Despite the best efforts of K-12 educators, too many students lose interest in math or even give up on it altogether. It's crucial that educators, schools, and districts address the underlying issues that contribute to negative emotions about math and create more math positive classrooms. Today we'll be looking at some practical strategies to support positive math classroom environments in your district. We're looking forward to an interesting presentation and discussion here, plus live Q&A. We welcome your questions, so do stay tuned. We're going to get started in just a minute or two here. First off, though, briefly, uh, some housekeeping notes here. First item, as it says here, for tech support, if you need help at any time, you can use the chat panel at the right side of your screen there. Uh, just set, select the name of our event host and producer, Jason York. Let him know if you're having any uh, technical problems, he'll be able to help you out there. Also, uh, second item, as it says here, if you don't have uh, computer speakers, if you have trouble listening at any time, uh, we will also post a phone number and access code in that chat window at the right. Uh, you can dial those to get audio access over the phone if that's easier for you or if you prefer. Uh, also, as I said earlier, we welcome your questions. Please feel free to ask a question at any time. Um, just enter it in the Q&A, bottom right-hand corner there. Not the chat, but uh, reserve questions for the Q&A. Uh, feel free to ask a question at any time, and we'll get to them at the end during the Q&A session. So once again, if you have a question, type it in at any time in that Q&A, bottom right-hand corner. Um, also, speaking of questions, uh, a common question we often get, last item on the slide here, uh, people ask if we'll be making this uh, recording available or the slides available, and the answer is yes. Everyone who registered or attended here today will uh, receive a follow-up email with links to where you can find the slides or the archive recording, uh, so keep an eye out for that. Also, one other note, we will be taking a couple poll questions here today, so you'll see those when we get to that point of the presentation. Uh, the poll question will launch as a panel at the right side of your screen. You can just select your answer and click Submit at the bottom. And uh, thanks in advance for your participation and being part of our uh, presentation here. Okay, so with that, uh, on to our presentation here. Uh, today we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Raj Shah. He is founder of the Math, Math Plus Academy and an author at McGraw-Hill, and a uh, renowned expert on math education. So uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to him. Raj, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for being uh, joining us today, and welcome to our webinar. Thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm excited. Um, good afternoon, to everyone. And uh, I'm going to share my screen so you can see my slides. There you go. So hopefully everyone can see that. Obviously, we're here to talk about how to support math positive classrooms, how to get kids excited about math. I mean, we wish we lived in a world where that was true for everyone, but sadly, uh, most kids not, do not feel so super confident and excited about mathematics. So I've dedicated the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years of my life trying to figure out how do we change this? How do we get kids excited about math? So you'll see here on the first slide my digital digits. So if anyone wants to tweet at me or email me, before, after, uh, during the presentation or afterwards, you know, feel free to do that. All right, let me get into it. So let me start with this. One of my favorite quotes is from the book, The Mathematician's Lament by Paul Lockhart. And he says, math is a fast, rich and fascinating adventure of the imagination. And I love this quote because it is not the way most people would perceive mathematics or do perceive mathematics. And I, I, I just like to start here to remind ourselves like math is an amazing subject. In fact, 
I, I, I think about, when I think about supporting math positive classrooms, I kind of have these five principles. And my first one is just simply that math, math itself is intrinsically irresistible. Now, if you're a math person on this call, then you're saying, well, yeah, I knew that already. But again, if I said this to the universe, many people would look at me funny, like, what do you mean math is intrinsically irresistible? I don't have any positive memories of mathematics. And so let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean and, and where I think we can go with this. And I'll start by just sharing my personal story a little bit of my formative story, I guess, about mathematics. So I'm one of these people who, for whatever reason, and I don't know why this is, but I've always had what I like to call an affinity for mathematics. As a kid, I was drawn to mathematical things. I like to play with Legos and um, mess around with numbers and just find shortcuts and patterns and things like that. And I realized that that's not normal for most people, but just like everyone else, I had to learn in the third grade my multiplication facts. And what I show here is kind of a visual representation of how I memorized those facts. These are my nines tables. You probably figured that out already. And I was one of those kids that was really good at memorizing my facts and memorizing things in general. And I think sometimes we confuse kids who can memorize with kids who can do math. But in any case, I had the, I had the facts and I knew them. And if you asked me what nine times seven was, I could tell you it was 63 and nine times two is 18. But they, the, the information in my brain wasn't really connected in any way. They were sort of random collection of facts that I could just memorize. And then because I was one of these kids who really did like mathematics, I would go to the elementary school library and pick out all the books on math and check them out and check them out over and over again. And one of the first books that I checked out was called The Magic House of Numbers. And uh, I think it's fair to say this book may have changed my life in many ways. And one of the things in that book was the multiples of nine written out as you might see them in a multiplication table, as you can see on the right side here. And I may have seen this in school, like my teachers might have shown me a multiplication table, but I don't recall like really remembering that they were in, in this pattern like this until I saw it in the book. And I immediately noticed, and as you probably have as well, mm -hmm. that in the ones column, the numbers go nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, as you go towards the bottom. And the same thing in the tens column, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that's kind of a cool pattern. If you've never seen it before, it's kind of neat. First time you see it, it's a discovery, it's, it's, it's neat. But then the book said to do something crazy, which I would never do on my own, which is to take those digits of each of the numbers, like 9, 18, 27, and add them together. So like 1 plus 8 is 9, 2 plus 7 is 9, 3 plus 6 is 9, and so on. And for me, this was literally a mind-blowing moment. Like, I've never seen anything like this. And I immediately had questions, and I wondered, like, why is this true? And how is it possible that the multiples of nine, the digits, if you add them up, they also add up to nine, which is the thing that you were multiplying by in the first place. And this doesn't happen for sevens and it doesn't happen for eights. Like what makes nine special? And this is one of those moments that I, I hope that we can try to give kids moments like this in our classrooms, because these are the moments that help people fall in love with mathematics. This is something I remember 40 some years later is that experience with the nine. And so I really try to think about how do I produce or create these kind of moments as often as I possibly can within the context of the curricular mathematics that we have to teach on a daily basis. And so I go back to that quote, math is an adventure and it should feel like an adventure. And uh, oftentimes I'll ask people, you know, when you think of the word adventure, what other words come to mind? And they'll say things like discovery and exploration and risk taking and danger. And uh, when I think about those words, I mean, you would not normally put those words together with mathematics. And yet we should. Math, the, the act of doing mathematics should feel like this. And when you get to the top, when you achieve something, you should feel that exhilaration and joy that you feel as if you were climbing a mountain or doing anything as adventurous like that. And so how do, we, how do we do this? How do we bring this kind of feeling into our math class? And you know, we as an education system have done some things 
to sort of, uh, I think, take the adventure out of mathematics. And as a result, while math is intrinsically irresistible, I think most people would agree that school math is often not that intrinsically irresistible. So we're going we're gonna to talk about today how to merge these two things together and really get kids to feel what it feels like to do math and to have fun with it in, in, in the context of the curriculum. Now, I think we have done some things to take the adventure out of math. Number one, we take all of K-12 mathematics and we break it into these tiny little bits that we call the standards. And I understand why we have the standards, they're important. But if a teacher were to teach in this fashion of every day, we're gonna take a little tiny step forward through these, this progression of standards, then what you get is someone sort of holding your hand uh, and kind of taking you up this mountain in very small steps, and you don't feel the adventure anymore. You're not going to feel the same sense of achievement and joy and exploration and risk-taking as if I just allowed you to climb the mountain. Um, so we have to resist the urge to teach little by little by little by little every single day. There have to be days where I let you go on the adventure. Um, and two, most educators are, feel like it is their responsibility to smooth out obstacles because we want all kids to learn the math. And so it feels like it's our job as teachers to make things easier and simplify them and take away the obstacles so that every child can learn. And I understand that, and sometimes that's the right thing to do. But if that's what you do all the time, again, you're taking all the adventure and fun out of the mathematics. And lastly, many, 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 many teachers are feeling a significant time constraint where they don't feel like they have enough time to cover all the material, especially in time for kids to excel on their uh, state testing or whatever high stakes testing that we have. And so we can often devolve into a, a routine of just sort of focusing on the procedures. You know what, I don't have time to really go deep here. So I'm gonna just show the kids when you see this kind of problem, these are the four steps you need to do in order to get the answer. And I understand why we do that, but the moment you do that, you're again taking the adventure out of mathematics. Okay, and I think as a result of this, we live in a world where 56% uh, of kids would rather eat broccoli than do math. And if that's where we are, we have a serious problem. If math can't beat out broccoli, we, we, we know we're doing something wrong. So let's, um, let's do some math because I don't like to talk for too long without letting you have some space to do some mathematics. So hopefully everybody's ready to do some math. I'm going to give you a second here to get some pencil and paper you might need for this next problem. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do this problem. So uh, here we go. Hopefully everyone's ready. It's a little trickier to do when I can't see your feedback immediately, but here we go. I'd like you to do four and two fifths minus two and two thirds. I'm going to go ahead and give you 30 seconds to do that. So please do that right now. All right, time is up, as they say, pencils down. Okay, now before we talk about the answer, you'll see that uh, we have a poll. What I really like to know before we talk about any answers is, how, does that, how did that feel? Every one of us has a little voice inside of our heads that kind of talks to us about how, uh, you know, this is, this is gonna be hard or I feel scared or fear. So I'd love to know if you felt stress, if you felt, sort of indifference, like I can do this, but that's not really that much fun. Was this challenging? Did it seem like a puzzle that you wanted to solve? Or did you like literally feel joy here? Like, oh, I'd love to do these, give me some more of these. These are awesome. So I'd love for you to be able to respond to that right now in your poll. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, what it felt like as a group. Okay, and we have our 
poll results. Roger, are you able to see those? Or uh, Actually, I am able to see them. That's fantastic. Okay. There you All go. right. So uh, typically when I do this with teachers, I find that many people will say they find it stressful, uh, partly because I give you a 30-second timer, partly because sometimes we feel peer pressure in a room uh, where you don't want to be the one person who gets the problem wrong. Uh, in this group, I think I have some mathematical ringers in the room. So we got a lot of people saying it was challenging and even a quarter of the people saying it was joyful, which is awesome. I will tell you that most people do not find fraction subtraction joyful. Uh, but what I want to do now is take this experience and compare it to a different type of math problem. So I'm going to give you another mathematical challenge here on the next uh, slide. Let me switch back over. There we go. All right. And what I'd like you to do now is take a look at this little house looking drawing. I'd like you to recreate this on your paper without lifting your pencil. So choose a dot that you want to start from and try and trace this out without lifting your pencil. Take uh, 10 or 15 seconds. Give that a whirl. Okay, uh, hopefully you've had ample time to kind of think through that and try a few different things. Um, I'm going to give you another puzzle so you can continue to work on this one, or if you have this one complete, I'd love for you to try the second one, which looks very similar, but now I've put a little extra set of lines in the middle and add a little dot. So to be clear, you can start at any dot and then try and trace the whole pattern with, oh, and sorry, I wasn't clear without retracing any of the edges. So try to do this without retracing a side. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Now that you've tried that, um, let's see if we can do another quick poll to see what that second one felt like. So you should have a poll on your screen now that allows you to reply. So you've, in this case, same poll, stress, indifference, challenge, or joy. Let's see if we get different answers this time. All right, looks like the poll has ended. I don't see the results just yet. Okay, oh, hey, okay. So uh, now we've got about 8% of people saying stress or indifference, and 65 saying challenge, and 23 saying joy. So about the same amount of people saying it's joyful, but definitely a lot more challenge and a lot less stress. So that's, that's exciting. Um, and uh, what I find when I, when I share this with people is that typically they'll say that the second set of problems, that, that the, the tracing problem, felt a little bit more like a puzzle like a, um, that you wanted to maybe solve, whereas the fraction problem seemed a little bit more like a pro, uh, an exercise that you needed to just do based on previous ways that you've learned how to do that. And that is kind of the distinction I want to draw between these two things, where one is more of an exercise and the other is more like a puzzle slash problem. And this is a, a thing that I find is that people will usually find the puzzly things to be more challenging, more joyful, and less stressful. So very cool. Thank you for sharing that. And you'll, you'll notice that I actually did not care what the answer to the fraction problem was. I just wanted to know um, what it felt like to do that. Um, same thing with the, the, the tracing. You're welcome to continue to try and do those tracing problems and, and create your own just for fun um, after we get done here. Okay, 
So that, that's going to set the stage for where we go from here. And so um, we take that and we say, oh, yeah. Um, when I talk to teachers, they will say to me, look, the things I struggle with the most is I have a lot of kids who expect everything to be explained. And so if I don't stand at the front and just tell them what to do, they don't seem like they want to engage in what we're doing. And I think a lot of that comes from a culture that we have created um, over time where we've kind of trained the kids to assume, assume that the teacher's job is to tell us how to do things. And it's my job to sit back and take notes and follow along as, instead of being more of a more active participant in the, in the doing and learning of the mathematics. Um, and in addition to that, many kids know it's almost like a learned helplessness. They know if they wait long enough, if they say, I don't know what's going on, I'm so confused, what do I do? Someone will help them, either a neighbor, uh, the person they're sitting next to, the teacher, someone's gonna pick up that pencil, either literally or figuratively and say, look, this is what you do. Do you see how this works? And the student may say, yeah, I get it now. But the, but the truth is that the person who's doing the work is the person who's doing the learning. And so while the student may feel like they've learned something, it's not necessarily true that they've learned it and will be able to continue to do it and really fundamentally understand it. So we have to break that culture. Two, we, you know, we have a lot of kids who, when they see a problem that is different from anything they've seen before, they just give up to, you know, they don't have that confidence or the mindset to kind of keep going and try things when the roadmap isn't clear. And lastly, uh, if we can, get them to learn their multiplication facts and their division facts and how to do fractions and whatnot. And then we give them a word problem. We often find that the kids don't know how to process the word problem. They just take the numbers and pick an operation and, and hope and pray that they have the right answer. And so we want them to really start to try and make sense of mathematics. So we're going to try and solve all those problems in the next 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, but I will say that the, the, the simple, simple solution in a way is if we can do more problem solving, we can break these routines and these habits and really develop the habits and the mindsets that we want to develop by putting kids in these situations where they feel safe, but also are being challenged to solve problems and make sense of the mathematics. So we're going to talk through that a little bit. The only problem with that really is that to do these problem solving activities in a classroom, in a whole group classroom, is can take a little bit more time than if I just told you how to do the math. And so for me, I sort of justify this investment in time by saying, look, if we're not doing problem solving, you're not really doing mathematics. Like mathematicians do not do routine exercises. They solve novel new problems or attempt to and fail and then go talk to people about it and figure it out. So that's what we want our kids to be doing, to experience what real math is. Also, this is when you give problem solving tasks, this is where you're going to find out if your kids really can and want to and, and will develop that perseverance that you want. Like, I love math, but I have no desire to do 100 multiplica repetitive multiplication problems. Like, that is not perseverance. That's compliance. So in problem solving, we can develop our kids' per true perseverance to do hard things. Um, and lastly, we know from many people's work, including Joe Bowler, that when you give more problem-based activities to your students and they start to work through them, they perform better on standardized tests, even when you don't, quote unquote, cover all the material that you were supposed to, because what you're doing is you're helping kids develop that habits of mind and the mindset to go through and solve difficult problems. Okay, so problem solving now is going to become a means of teaching and learning math, just not a way of just applying it. So normally what we do is we teach how to do the math and then we get the word problems, which is quote application or problem solving at the end. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually give kids problem solving tasks at the beginning and use that as a way to motivate the need to learn the mathematical skills that you need. Um, so remember that math really is intrinsically irresistible. We just have to be able to show kids what real math looks like in that particular context. And I'm going to dive into that a little bit more as we go along. Second thing is, you know, everyone really can do math. Um, again, shouldn't be controversial, but sometimes is, especially because we live in a culture where 
People believe that there exists a math gene and you either get it or you don't. And we, we label people as math people and things like that, right? Um, it turns out that scientists have actually looked to find if there is a gene or set of genes that predispose you to being good at mathematics. And the answer is no, there isn't or, or aren't. Well, there, there's no such thing. Uh, also, you should know that there are places in the world you can go, cultures that you can be in and immerse yourself in, where the notion of a math gene doesn't even exist. If you said to somebody, I'm not a math person, I didn't get the math gene, they literally would not know what you're talking about. This is a construct of our culture. It's a diabolical one, but it's one that we have to fight to, uh, against. Now, as a system, we also do some things that make it seem like there exist math people or not. We label kids. We label them as gifted or smart. Or what I hear now a lot from teachers is, you know, this would be good for my low kids, or this would be good for my high kids, but my low kids wouldn't be able to do it. And the minute we label kids, we change how we approach them, we change what we expect of them at a very subconscious level, and we just cannot do that. Every kid can do math. Are there kids that presently struggle with multiplication? Absolutely. Are there kids who presently struggle with fractions? You bet. Is it my job to meet them exactly where they are and take them as far as I can? Yes. And it doesn't matter. Uh, calling them low or high is not going to help me do that. So we need to stop labeling kids. They're just kids and they can all do math. They're all mathematicians. And then the last thing I think is important when we think about why do so many people not like mathematics is this, this last piece, which is everyone fails at math eventually because math is the one subject that gets harder every single year. If you learn how to add, then you have to subtract. If you learn how to do that, you have to multiply and then divide and then fractions and then decimals and then variables and then algebra and then geometry. It's the one place where every single person is going to fail. And if you live in a world where we believe that there are math people and not math people, then you can easily convince yourself that you're not a math person. So I think it's really important for us as educators to remember that our students have these voices inside their brains that are built from all their past experiences that are saying to them, yeah, you're a math person or you're not, and we need to break that down. Um, so let me get into it. Let's, how do we fix this? So at my learning journey uh, as an educator, I, um, I was sitting in the classroom once with what most people would consider gifted kids, kids who had had positive experiences with math. And I had this amazing math problem and I was like, I couldn't wait to share it with them. This is going to be so much fun. And I put it out there and just crickets. Nobody wants to engage in my problem. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't really have any other tools in my toolbox besides here's the problem, go. And so what did I do? I kind of fell back on like, well, you know, if I show them a first little bit, maybe that'll get them going and they'll go. So I showed them the first little bit of the problem. And I said, see, do you see how this works? Okay, you guys take it from here. And still nobody wants to engage. And I know a lot of teachers have felt this. And so before I knew it, I had sort of done all the work and they hadn't done any of the learning. And I left that experience thinking, if I can't get kids who like math to do a challenging problem, I have no hope of helping anyone else who maybe doesn't like math as much or hasn't fallen in love with math yet. So I started thinking about where are the places where people are naturally engaged and where they persevere in doing things. And it occurred to me, because I had teenage boys at the time, that there is a place where kids naturally engage and persevere, and that's video games. Um, also sports, but we're going to focus in on video games and how, how do video games get us to engage and persevere in these things that have uh, no essential value to our real lives. So I put up here some examples of some really well-designed video games. Um, and what I've learned is that video game designers have spent the last 40 years figuring out how to make these games really addictive, and they've done it by tapping into fundamental truths about human psychology. And the good news is teachers can tap into those same exact things. So let's talk about that a little bit. And by the way, uh, video games are the one place where no kid has ever asked, when am I ever going to use this? So I think we can all agree, if you played Angry Birds, no kid needs to know how to fling birds at pigs. But strangely, Millions of people have spent billions of hours doing exactly this thing. 
So how? How does this work? How do they get us to do these things uh, over and over and over again? And I, I want to start by talking about what is a game, because a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. And I love this definition because what is a math problem or a problem solving task? It is an unnecessary obstacle. If I can get kids to do it voluntarily, it's going to feel like a game. And those of us who like to do puzzles and have had positive math experiences, that's, that's how we kind of perceive math as, as a game of things to solve and go figure out. So video games do five things really well that I want to share with you. Number one is they give the student control of the action, right? And the average student has very little control over the day. So when they get control, they really enjoy that. So we as educators need to figure out where are the places within the activity that I can give students control of what is the question, how am I going to approach the question, how am I going to solve it? We need to give them that space to have control over things. And that means letting go. Um, number two, probably the most important one, is video games, the well-designed ones, always make you feel like you can catch the bus. And if you feel like you can catch the bus, you will run to catch it. And the way that they do that is they make the first level of the game ridiculously simple. Now, I'm guessing most of the people on this call have seen or played Tetris, but if you haven't played in a while, you might have forgotten what level one feels like. And here I usually show a video, but here you're just going to have to play along with me and kind of imagine. In the first level of Tetris, when that first piece comes out and starts to fall towards the bottom of the well, um, you might be surprised to know that it takes 30 seconds for that piece to fall to the bottom. It's exceedingly slow. And that is a deliberate design choice because that way every single person who ever plays this game has the opportunity to make sense of what do the pieces look like, what happens when I rotate them, where are they going to go, and that way no one feels overwhelmed when they first start this game. Then what happens in Tetris? Pieces are going to come down a little bit faster and a little bit faster until they're coming down at exactly the right speed for me. And it's in those moments that I'm in the zone. And when I'm in the zone playing this game, it gets really thrilling and exciting, and my brain literally gets dopamine hits. And dopamine is the chemical that makes me want to play this game over and over. It's a pleasure chemical that um, normally you would get from something like caffeine or other um, uh, illicit things that we won't talk about on this call. So we got to start really, really simple and build the, the momentum as slowly as we can so that every single student feels like they have a place to start. Now, I want you to imagine what if the first time you played Tetris, the pieces were coming down like at level 20 speed, super fast, and they just fall like rain, and they stack up to the top of the screen, and the game ends within a few seconds, and you've lost. Now, you're probably going to quit in that situation, but does that mean you, have, uh, you don't have a growth mindset, or you're lazy, or you can't persevere? No. It means that you're a normal human being, and too often, we are putting kids in situations where they feel like they're on level 20 of Tetris, and they're giving up. And so if we can't make everyone feel like they're on level one of Tetris, we can't expect every student to engage. Um, the next thing is video games do a great job of normalizing failure. Every single time you play Tetris, you lose. There's no way to win at Tetris, and yet it is one of the most addicting games ever made. And the key point here is it's fun to fail if the game seems fair and you have hope of success. And the way Treacherous was designed, where it starts super slow on level one, the game is going to seem fair, and I'm going to feel like I have hope of success. So we need to build this in to the way in which we introduce our activities and then help kids move up through the complexity of solving those problems. Uh, and then the next piece is video games do a great job of giving you what I call descriptive feedback. In this screen of Super Mario Brothers, you're seeing the player knows how many lives they have, how many coins they've collected, how much their score is, how much time is left, which way to go, and if they were dynamically playing, they'd have sound effects. So much feedback. Now, as teachers, we can't give this much feedback to every student instantaneously like a video game can, but can we amp up our game? Can we start to help kids understand where am I at, where am I going, what's working, because that's what this game is doing, and you're 
the learner is learning how to use that feedback to improve inside the game. Now, on this screen, my favorite thing is that big star coin on the left with the two empty circles, because that's telling me I have one of those coins, but there's two more left to get. And you can win this, you can complete this level without getting those two coins. But because of those two empty circles, a lot of people will go back and play the level again to get those extra coins. And that's the best kind of feedback you can give when you're showing kids where you're at, where you could be going. So they want to go back and uh, figuratively get those two extra coins. So we need to be answering these five questions. Where am I going? Where am I now? What's going well? What can I improve? And what did I learn? Because that's how video games teach you to get better in game and continue to progress. All right. And then the last thing is video games never electrocute your deer. And you might be wondering what that means, so I'll explain really quick. Um, a story I heard from a video game designer, actually. Imagine you're in the woods and you haven't eaten for days, and all you can, all you have is a bow and arrow, and off in the distance you see a deer. So you take out an arrow and you shoot, and you miss because you're not a very good archer. Um, but you can't quit because, again, you're starving, and this is the only food that you can see. Uh, so you inch up closer so it's not to scare the deer, and you shoot again, and you miss. And you keep doing that until finally you get point blank. You're about to get your kill. There's no way you can miss. And lightning comes down, bam, and strikes the deer dead. What does that feel like? And a lot of people will say that feels like disappointment or like the, the, that it was taken away from you, that your ability to do this for yourself was taken away. And as math teachers, when we give kids the answers before they know what the answers are, we are electrocuting the deer. And when you electrocute the deer, you take away the dopamine hit. And when you take away the dopamine hit, you take away anyone getting, ever getting addicted to mathematics. So we need to stop telling kids the answers because when you tell the answers, all thinking stops. If I have the right answer, I'm done. There's no more thinking necessary. And if I don't, I'm done because I didn't get it right and I may not be motivated to try and fix it. So as much as we can, holding off on telling kids the answers to keep the thinking going. All right, and then the last thing here is, uh, this is a famous philosopher, Jaden Shaw, happens to be my son. He has a very fixed mindset about things, but he'll play video games forever. And I asked him one day, well, why do you play these games when you lose all the time? And he says, video games don't judge me. And I think that's super profound because so many people feel judged when doing math, either by themselves or by their peers or by their teacher or by their parents, whatever it is we feel judged, especially because math has right answers. So anything we can do to lower the stakes is gonna help our students. And you can do that by removing time constraints, allowing kids to collaborate, letting them focus on uh, the solutions and not so much just getting the right answer, but like, how did you think about this? And giving them those accessible entry points, that level one of Tetris starting point where everyone can feel comfortable. All right, I need to, go a little bit quicker here. So what I want teachers to think about is, how do you craft a learning experience where it feels like a video game, where they're starting on level one of Tetris and it's getting a little bit more challenging and you have some control of the action and we're not telling you the answers and we're giving you that descriptive feedback. If we can do that, we can really get kids, and I've seen this work over and over and over again, kids will naturally engage in math when presented this way. Now, the last piece of this is, I said a game was the voluntary acceptance of unnecessary obstacles. So how do I get kids to volunteer? Well, I got to get them to volunteer by making them curious. All good learning starts with curiosity, right? And there are many ways that you can do that. I just want to share two or three of those with you. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so I can share those. But the way to get somebody to cure, the way to get someone curious is to create a gap between what they already know and what they don't know yet. And for example, the teaser for the, for the evening news, they do this. They'll come on primetime TV and they'll say, in the commercials, they'll say, fire, more at 11. And you immediately have questions. You want to know, where is the fire? Was anybody injured? Is it near my house? You have those questions and that makes you curious. So, and that only works because you know what fire is and you know in this context it's bad. So we as teachers, we need to create those kind of moments where the kids will naturally want to lean in and then we have that task for them. So, one way you can do that is you can take a problem that seems like a mundane problem. Here's a very mundane area problem, simple exercise, and you can invert it. 
and will seem more like a puzzle and really open things up. This is a simple strategy that teachers can use very quickly to take something boring and turn it into something interesting. So if I flip this around, I could say, hey, look, the area of this rectangle is 12. What are its dimensions? And I've created a whole different kind of experience for my students by just flipping that around. So that's one way. Another way is um, what, uh, withholding some information. This, these, this example is from Open Middle. Uh, Robert Komplinski has a site where they have a reservoir of these. But this is a subtraction problem where it's a challenge where you have to put in the digits one through nine in those six missing boxes. You can only use each digit once, and you need to create a difference that's as close to 500 as possible. This is a puzzle. And because I've withheld some information, I've created this information gap. I know the answer, but I don't know what those numbers are that go in there. And this is different than what I normally get. What I normally get is all the numbers and you produce the answer. So these kinds of little things can really change how kids think about approaching and wanting to approach the mathematics. And then I'll share with you my third, my third one. I have a lot of these. This is, this is probably my favorite one. Is I could ask you right now, how much is a pound of dimes worth? And if you're curious about that, and when I've done this, most people will say they are not very curious about that. And why would you be? Like, how often do you run across a pound of dimes? Pretty much never. So not that engaging. I could also ask you, okay, well, how much is a pound of quarters worth? And again, not super engaging, not something you'd be curious about. You could certainly figure it out if I gave you, you know, how much they weigh and stuff like that. But magically, if I say, would you rather have a pound of dimes or a pound of quarters? Immediately, people in the room are like, oh, wait, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to get more dimes. Maybe I want the dimes, but the quarters are worth more. And you start to think, now you're curious. Now you will engage in the task at hand. And what I've done here is magically taken two things that you normally would find not that interesting and put them together with a would you rather and turn it into an interesting question. So this is something very simple that teachers can do with a tiny bit of practice. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is surprise. Um, and I think in the interest of time, yeah, I'm going to do this real quick and then we'll get to questions. So uh, I want to share this subtraction problem with you real quick. Imagine I asked you to do this, 546 minus 267. Now, I know everyone on this call can do this problem. Uh, and most people will probably do it the way that we were taught in second grade. But now I'm going to tell you something. Your second grade teacher lied to you about two things about subtraction. They just told you a blatant lie. And if I said that to you, I'm guessing some of you would be curious to know what those two things were. So let's actually investigate what those two things are. The first thing is they told you that you have to start on the right and work your way to the left. And that's just absolutely not true. You read from left to right. You read numbers from left to right. You absolutely can do this problem from left to right. So I'm going to show you how to do that with a simpler problem. So let's take a look at this. 546 minus 314. We can do this together. You can start on the left and you can say 500 minus 300. That's 200. Super simple. 40 minus 10. That's 30. I'm at 230. 6 minus 4 is 2. 232, 232, and you can get the answer going left to right. And in a way, it's easier because you can just say the answer as you're doing the mathematics. Normally, we would make you write all the digits down and then from right to left and then read the number back out from left to right. It's kind of a wasted step. Now, of course, I made this easier because there's no regrouping or borrowing required. So let's go back. Sorry. Let's go back to my original problem. Uh, and let's actually tackle the second lie you were told. The second lie you were told is that you can't take 7 from 6. You just can't do 6 minus 7. That's why you got to go over to your neighbor and get some stuff. But that's not true. We know what 6 minus 7 is. It's minus 1, negative 1. So what if we just let negatives happen? What would happen? So let's try and combine these two things. Let's go left to right, and let's let negatives happen and see what, let's just see what happens. So we're going to do this problem, 546 minus 267. And I'm going to do 500 minus 200 is 300. Oops. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to do 40 minus 60 is weirdly, or 4 minus 6 is negative 2. I'm just going to put that there for now. And we'll figure out what it means. And 6 minus 7 is negative 1. So there you go. Uh, if you show that to somebody else, they probably go, what does that even mean? But we understand place values. So that really means 300 minus 20 minus 1, which you can do. 300 minus 20 is 280. Take one more. That's 279. And I challenge you to go do this the old-fashioned way, and you'll discover that, indeed, 
you will get the same answer. And I think that's super cool. So hopefully uh, I may have showed you something new that's a little surprising, but you can actually do math from left to right. And if you let the negatives happen, um, you can just sort of do it. And I have done this, if you do this a few times, you can literally just do it in your head to just keep the rounding tally. So I, when I do this, I do 500 minus 200 is 300. 40 minus 60, okay, take away 20, I'm at 280. Take away one more, I'm at 279. And you're able to do this super quick. So um, sometimes we can take things that are interesting and present them in a way that is surprising. And so much of mathematics is surprising, but we present it in ways in which it's not. So we just need to flip the script on that. So how do teachers make this change? Well, using those little curiosity tools, you can take a problem like this, and this is a first grade problem that's uh, from a textbook. And you know, I look at this problem, it's got a lot of words. I think on a scale of one to 10 for engagement, for first graders, this is probably like a one, two, or three. It's not super engaging. It would be a lot for a first grader to read. But could I change it really quickly into something better? So I thought to myself, well, it's a lot of words. Could I get rid of the words? Well, if I got rid of the words, I would need a picture. So can I make this into a picture? Well, what if I gave them this? And I said, what do you guys notice about this? And what do you wonder? Kids would immediately notice there's three floors and there's doors on the third floor and doors on the first floor. And they could count them. Maybe they count them one at a time. Maybe they count them by supervising them in some way. And then naturally they might wonder how many are on the second floor. Whoops. And if I told them there were 15 doors in all, then we could lean into this problem in a completely different way. So I'm crafting a new experience based on a problem that I already had, trying to use my video game design principles of getting kids curious, letting them have some control over what they talk about and what the question is, and then creating a whole different way of kind of teaching kids the math. So I hope you can kind of see from that um, in this monologue format what that would feel like and see how that's different than how we might normally approach solving that problem. And my hope is that with, a, and, I, and I know from coaching teachers, that with a little bit of practice, we can get pretty good at doing these fairly quickly um, and just taking what they have and making it better. And I am going to say that the last principle here is math is best learned do, by doing together, not by being told. And so many of us learned math uh, sort of on our own, like sitting in rows. I certainly thought that if I ever got, if I ever did my math with someone else, that that was kind of cheating. Like I was supposed to do everything by myself. And it turns out that the best way to learn math is by doing it with other people. And it also is another way of lowering the stakes and making kids feel more comfortable. So when we do these problem solving tasks, can we get the kids in small groups to work through things together and provide them the support as they struggle through the problems? And then my role as a teacher is simply to provide hope of success because if I continue to come by and ask questions and keep the kids moving in the right direction, they will keep going because it'll feel like a video game. All right, so those are my five principles. Uh, for building that math positive classroom. Um, remember that, you know, we are purveyors of the best subject in school, math. I don't know how anyone makes English fun, but math is absolutely amazing. And it's um, really fun when we can show kids how awesome it is. Uh, reminding teachers that, you know, everyone can do math. I know we all know that, but sometimes we lose sight of it. And then crafting those experiences like a video game designer, where you start with curiosity and build from there. Um, and then letting kids do math together. So I'm going to stop there. Hopefully I gave you some ideas for how to start to shift the culture of the classroom and present things in ways that are going to be more engaging than we typically do. And uh, I'm happy to take questions and answers at this point. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raj. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, great presentation. Really appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, to our audience, uh, now is your chance to ask questions. If you have any questions for uh, Raj, uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, if you are interested in getting this presentation later on, we will be making it available. Uh, we are recording and we'll make the slides available to you. Uh, everyone will get a follow-up email later on with those, so don't worry about that. Uh, you may want to share this uh, with some of your teachers in your district other administrators, curriculum director, somebody like that. Um, so uh, you'll have ample opportunity to do that. And if uh, another quick reminder, if you do have uh, questions, just enter in the Q&A 
not the chat window, but in the Q&A, uh, the bottom right-hand corner there. Uh, Raj, first off, I, I have a question. Uh, you know, we yeah. we go to, to uh, district administrators, uh, DA all over uh, the country. Um, you're describing a pretty dramatic culture change when it comes to math instruction. How, um, yeah. but I, I can't help but think that students do move up, of course, through grades and through yeah. math teachers. Um, how much of this has to be done on a school or district wide level? If you, um, how much impact can a single teacher that, have? Uh, what do you think? That's, about that? that's a fantastic question. So, I mean, in, in an ideal world, you need to have the whole team, K-12, on the same page, at least trying to move in this direction so that it isn't one isolated teacher who changes the world for a few kids and then the next year they go back to the way it was. Um, so, you know, when I work with schools and districts, that's what we work on is trying to get that throughout as best we can. And then you're right also that there's a lot, what I've presented here in 45 minutes is a lot of change for a lot of people. And so we kind of break it down into small pieces. You know, can I take an existing problem that I already have and can I just tweak it in a way that gets kids curious? Maybe that's what I do. And I do that for a while until I get comfortable with that. And then I layer on the next piece of it. So we really try and break it down because you, you can't just change it all at once. And if you did, a lot of your kids would, would sort of revolt against that. So you just want to make these small, pieces and that's how change happens one little step at a time but i mean when when i see teachers who have been able to make these changes over time what's really neat to hear is that the is that kids are saying you know when are you going to give us another like challenge problem like we want more challenge problems when are we going to do more of those uh and to me that's like the most exciting piece of all of this and i know that it happens it takes time and it's you know with any change there's ups and downs and it's a roller coaster and there's good days and bad but we really can make a difference in how kids perceive math and how they perceive themselves as mathematicians, which is really cool. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, let's see, some other questions coming in here from the audience. Um, thanks to our audience for uh, your submissions here. Uh, let's see, this question, interesting question, kind of breaking it down, so the different types of math questions that you're talking about presenting. Uh, yeah. not just your standard maybe rote memorization or something like that. Mm -hmm. So someone asks, what what would you suggest be the percent of this breakdown, say word problems? So they give examples. Yeah. Explanation, thirty percent, standard problems, thirty percent, word problems. How do you uh, do you have any thoughts how you allocate yeah, I, that? I don't know that I can answer that specifically, specifically. because every obviously everything's every class and every set of kids is different but i will say that like as a general principle I, what i try and do is i try and bring some sort of even if it's small problem solving challenge to the beginning of the unit something that i think is going to motivate them to want to learn the math that or need to learn the math that's coming so like i said before like kind of flipping it around where you do the problem at the beginning and what's neat about that is then you see like you get a real good formative assessment of what the kids already understand, what they don't understand. Can they draw pictures and diagrams to make sense of this? Because I'm not expecting them to use formal uh, skills because I haven't taught them those formal skills yet. So I kind of try and start there. And then, you know, I'm not suggesting that there's never any exercises and never any repetition. Kids need some level of repetition, but just that through these problem solving activities, we can make the repetition and some of those other things more meaningful because now I have a reason to want to get better at this task because it relates back to some other experience that I've had. And in fact, um, that's what we've done with the, the new, you know, curriculum with Reveal Math is try to build these what we call Ignite activities into every uh, unit so that it starts off with something like this that kind of motivates the kids, but it also has that level one Tetris where everyone can do something. Okay, sure. Uh, let's see a couple more uh, questions. We just have a few minutes left here, but um, you know, we were just talking earlier on about changing the culture, and somebody asked while you were speaking there, how, uh, any advice for changing the culture of the school in this area? Anything else you would add to uh, what you already said? 
Well, I think in every, like, sometimes change happens top down and sometimes change happens bottom up. And you can't always wait for everything to happen top down. So if there's teachers here, I would, I would encourage them to try and slowly recruit someone, you know, who can be your, you know, teammate and start to plan and, and make small changes and move in this direction. And then you slowly build and you build. And then eventually people are like, whoa, what's going on in my classroom over there? Why are those kids always like really engaged? And uh, what's all that noise? And you kind of build that way if it doesn't come top down. Um, and then, oh, I lost my train of thought there a little bit. Ask me that question again real quick. Uh, just uh, how, to, how to change the culture of a school. So you're right. saying yeah. top down or bottom up, grassroots. Yeah. And it, it, all, all change is difficult and all things just do it small, little by little. Because again, if, if, you've, if many people in your school have been teaching in a traditional fashion, then you make these changes where you're opening up more questions, you're challenging kids more, you're making them talk more, all that. Um, that's gonna upset some of the kids, right? Like some of the kids have learned how to listen to instructions and follow and repeat all the exercises and they get A's and now you're gonna tell them like, oh, I want you to actually try, take, so it's gonna be a change, but what's neat is you see different aspects of the kids and some of the kids who you weren't so sure would step up, they step up. And some of the kids you thought were like knew everything, you find out that, well, actually they could do the repetitive things, but maybe their understanding wasn't quite there. So you get a really good um, idea of what's really going on with, with your students. So it's, it's really kind of fun when you're able to start doing it a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, another interesting question here from an educator saying, uh, I teach high school geometry. Yeah. Um, and they're describing having a lot of students that are significantly behind and where we supplement, reteach, and teach uh, using leading explorative uh, questioning. But due to the lack of previous math understanding, getting them on grade level is overwhelming. How do I create that environment to encourage kids to try when they're so far behind? Raj, uh, some of the things you're talking about here, um, what about that kind of scenario when students are behind or you have an intervention scenario? Do, you, do these things still apply or is that a different uh, different scenario altogether? What do you think? So this is a common question. And if I had the answer to this, I mean, wow. Uh, but I'll give some suggestions. So uh, can we find problems where there really is that level one where I can draw a picture to make start to make sense of it? And I know some kids won't need that picture, but some kids will. And so um, that's one thing I often think about. The other thing I think about is when, when we have these kids who make it so far down the line and they, you know, quote unquote, can't multiply or, or deal with integers or whatever it is, um, can I at that point give them some other support? Is, it the right, is that the right time to maybe introduce um, a calculator, right? Uh, is that the right time to do some other things they go along with what I, the changes that I'm trying to make. So I don't have a magic bullet to this. Um, it's, it's obviously a very difficult problem. It's probably one that we start to change over time as we start building these cultures, you know, from kindergarten on up. Uh, the other thing I would say is, um, with respect to this, is, oh, what, oh man, I lost my train of thought again. That's just uh, strange. But, I'll, I'll think, uh, let me see if I can come back to that. If we have one more question, I'll. I'll... Uh, sure, yeah. sure, no problem. Yeah, actually, there's another really interesting question here. So, yeah. uh, someone describing uh, doing some of these things differently with math and instruction, and they say, but yeah. when I have observations, uh, my administration or administrators are unable to understand what we're doing. How do I clarify that what I'm doing is beneficial to students? Uh, I think you talked earlier. Yeah. About, yeah, yeah, justifying that, right? Yeah, so so a lot of times too, people will say, well, I'm supposed to write the objective for the day on the board, and if I do that, I've sort of ruined the surprise of whatever it is that we're going to work on. So I think one way to do this is to really, when you do this, you are doing naturally 
almost all of the standards of mathematical practice that the eight standards of mathematical practice that we have, making sense of problems, perseverance, solving them, critiquing the reasoning of others, looking for pattern and structure, uh, all those things. And so I would really focus on my, you know, letting my administrators know this is where I'm going, right? I'm, this is what you should be looking for and you're going to see in my classrooms when I try and do it this way. And yes, it's different, but we know from the research and from the data that this kind of stuff works. Oh, and I realized what I was going to say. Sometimes when I think about these kids who are still struggling with things that we think they should have known, you know, years before, I think my mindset is always someone, we haven't been able to give them the experience yet where it connects for them. And so I just continue to think about how can I be creative in giving them a new way to look at this? Is there a new visual picture of this that they can use to make sense of it? Is there a new um, strategy that I can show them that would make more sense than the way that they're trying to do it? That's always what I think about is, and have they been given enough time to not just try and memorize things, but to actually think through why they work the way that they do? And I realize that's really, really difficult because you're trying to teach geometry and then it's also your responsibility to fix the gaps with integers. And I get that that's not fair, but we get what we get and we just do the best we can. That's what, that's what teachers do. Okay, sure. Uh, great advice. Well, uh, we have reached the top of the hour here. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, submitted your questions. Really appreciate uh, your participation in our discussion here. Uh, on behalf of all of us here at District Administration, once again, I'd like to thank our speaker for today, Raj Shah. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, sharing your time and expertise. It's really interesting. And thank you again to our sponsor, McGraw-Hill, for their generous support of our webinar here. And to everyone in our audience, thank you so much for joining us. I do hope you found our webinar informative and useful to you. Producing events like this one is just part of our mission here at DA to inform school district leaders like you about news and trends in K-12 management. You'll find more coverage about issues that we looked at here in the pages of our print magazine, as well as our digital edition and website through additional web seminars like this one and through our various e-newsletters, which you can sign up for right on our website, uh, that are all free as well. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we got a couple questions about this. Uh, for any of you who would like to uh, go back over the content here, uh, this is being recorded. It will be archived on the DA site in our web seminars section, um, and we'll also be sending out a follow-up email with links to the archive recording as well as the slides. So if you want to go back over it, share with uh, anyone on your team at your district, any of your teachers, you'll be able to do that later on. So keep an eye out for that follow-up email. So that is it for today's event. Once again, I'm Kurt Isaac Early for District Administration on behalf of everyone here at DA. Goodbye, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining us today.